One-way slabs are elements in one-way construction where the members are designed to support loads through bending in a single direction. Where the ratio of the long to the short side of a slab panel is greater than 2. The load is transferred predominantly by bending in the short direction. If we look at the plan view, the main flexural reinforcement in a one-way slab runs parallel to the direction of load transfer. One-way slabs must have sufficient thickness so that the applicable strength and serviceability requirements are satisfied. If the slabs are not connected to non-structural parts like partitions that can be damaged by large deflections, a chosen minimum thickness of the slab from this table gathered from ACI Table 7.3.1.1 will satisfy these requirements. For cantilever spans, L is the clear projection of the cantilever. An example on how to use this table is in the following figure, where we have a cantilever, one side continuous, and both side continuous slabs. In this case, we choose the largest thickness and round up to 8 inches for all to have the same thickness and a more economical formwork. To determine the bending moments and shear in one-way slabs, the simplified method in ACI can be used under specific conditions. Members are prismatic, which means that the cross-section does not change along the member length, loads are uniformly distributed, live load is less than or equal to three times the dead load, there are at least two spans, the longer of the adjacent two spans does not exceed the shorter by more than 20%. From ACI Table 6.5.2, the following figure have been made for demonstration of how to use the table to determine the bending moment and shear values when having three or more spans. For the interior spans, the maximum positive moment is always WL squared over 16, where L is the length of the interior span. And at the faces of the interior supports, the negative moment is WL squared over 11, where L is the average length of the two neighboring spans as shown. For the exterior spans with fixed end supports, the value is different depending on whether the end is a spandrel beam or a column. The exterior faces of the first interior support always have the value of WL squared over 10, where L is the average length of the two neighboring spans. The shear values shown in the green lines are very simple to calculate. Only the shear at the exterior face of the first interior support has a slightly higher value. When having only two spans, the values of the first interior negative moments are calculated as follows. All the remaining values are the same as previously shown. The distributed loads shall be determined in correspondence with the load combinations in ACI Table 5.3.1. To determine the flexural strength of a reinforced concrete one-way slab, let us have a closer look at a segment of the slab. Considering that the thickness of the slab is H and the distance to the reinforcement from the top is D, we can approximate D by taking it as H minus 1.25 inches. Under positive bending moments, the bottom of the slab is subject to tension and thus is where the reinforcement is placed. The top of the slab will be in compression. The width under consideration is B, which is usually taken as 12 inches in one-way slabs. The depth of the compression block A results from force equilibrium. It is assumed that a uniform stress equal to 85% of the compressive concrete strength is distributed over the depth A. 
where C is the distance from the compression fiber to the neutral axis. The maximum strain in the concrete is assumed to be 0.003. Beta 1 relates the depth of the compression block to that of the neutral axis and is determined as follows depending on the concrete compressive strength. The bending strength of the one-way slab can then be calculated as follows with the limitation that the strain should be greater than or equal to the yield strain plus 0.003 because the section should be tension controlled. The shear strength of a one-way slab is purely dependent on the concrete strength resulting from the slab thickness. For non-pre-stressed members the following equation can be used. The factor lambda s is used to account for the fact that the shear strength does not increase in direct proportion with the slab thickness. It becomes evident that the lambda s is less than 1 for members with d greater than 10 inches. The term lambda is the modification factor reflecting the reduced mechanical properties of lightweight concrete relative to normal weight concrete of the same compressive strength. The term raw W is equal to the flexural reinforcement area AS divided by BD. To minimize the likelihood of diagonal compression in the concrete and to limit the extent of cracking, the cross-sectional dimensions must be chosen to satisfy the following equation. Thus, the maximum moment in each span is used to determine the required flexural reinforcement using this equation. The provided flexural reinforcement should be greater than the required minimum but less than the maximum allowed such that the section is tension controlled. A minimum amount of shrinkage and temperature reinforcement equal to the following must be provided at a maximum spacing of the least of 18 inches and 5 times the thickness of the slab. The minimum clear spacing of parallel reinforcing bars in a single horizontal layer is shown as follows, where DAGG is the nominal maximum aggregate size in the concrete mix. The maximum center to center spacing of reinforcing bars is set as follows to control cracking. C sub C is the least distance from the surface of the reinforcement and the tension face. And FS is two thirds the yield strength of the flexural reinforcement bars. Development lengths of deformed bars are given in ACI 25.4 and are summarized in this table for normal weight concrete and the conditions mentioned at the bottom of this table. Whenever hooks are used for development, the hook diameter depends on the bar size and so do the extension lengths of the hook. The tension development length of the hook, LDH, is determined from the following table. Flexural reinforcement must be properly developed or anchored in a reinforced concrete one-way slab for the slab to perform as intended in accordance with the strength design method. The critical sections for the development of flexural reinforcements are at points of maximum stress and at points where adjacent reinforcement is terminated because it is no longer required to resist flexure. For the one-way slab shown here, the total area of negative reinforcement for the maximum negative factored bending moment at critical section MU minus A is equal to A minus and the total number of reinforcing bars at this location is equal to N where all bars are the same size. Similarly, the total area of positive reinforcement for the maximum positive factored bending moment MU plus C at critical section C is equal to AS plus and the total number of reinforcing bars at this location is equal to P. Assume a portion of AS minus is cut off at section B where it is no longer required for flexural strength. 
the reinforcement to be cut off is called AS-2 and the number of reinforcing bars is N2. The remaining reinforcement AS-1 must be able to resist the negative factored moment at section B. Because section B is a critical section, N1 bars must be adequately developed to the right of this section. Because section A is a critical section, N2 bars must be adequately developed to the right of this section. Additionally, these bars must extend beyond the point where they are no longer required. Assume a portion of AS plus is cut off at section D where it is no longer required for flexural strength. The reinforcement to be cut off is called AS plus 2 and the number of reinforcing bars is P2. The remaining reinforcement AS plus 1 must be able to resist the positive factored moment at section D. The bars cut off at section D must be developed to a distance greater than or equal to LD beyond section C. Like in the case of the negative reinforcement, these bars must extend beyond the point they are no longer required. According to ACI, at least one-fourth of the positive reinforcement must extend at least six inches into the support. Lab splices are frequently specified and are usually the most economical type of splice. There are basically two types of lab splices, contact and non-contact. In a contact lab splice, the bars are generally in contact over a specified length and are tied together, as shown in A. In a non-contact lab splice, the bars are not in contact and the center-to-center -center spacing of the bars being spliced must not exceed the limits indicated in B. Contact lab splices are usually preferred because the bars are tied together and are less likely to displace during construction. The minimum clear spacing between a contact lab splice and adjacent splices or bars is the same as that for individual bars. Lab splices should be provided at locations away from the maximum stress and should be staggered when possible. Reinforcing bars provided for negative bending moments should be spliced near the midspan of the member, and reinforcing bars provided for positive bending moments should be spliced over the supports. The required tension lab splice length depends on the tension development length of the bars. In summary, the recommended reinforcement details of one-way slabs are shown in this figure. If you would like to see a video about the design of two-way slabs, please mention it in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.